I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to our church family. Overflow started eight years ago with a vision to be a multiplying church. There are 290,000 people in this region that have no connection to a church or a relationship with Jesus. And we've known from day one that saying yes to God meant that we would never be able to judge the success of our church by how many people gathered in the building, but by walking alongside individuals who encountered Jesus and began to respond to the call of Jesus on their life and then help them start new churches where they live, work, and play that would continue to share the story of Jesus in neighbors. Uh, communities and neighborhoods all across the region. And this year, we're celebrating uh, that uh, we are now a family of four churches. And so whether you're worshiping today uh, with Reclamation Church in Coldport, or whether you're in Altoona with Renew, uh, Overflow, or The Cord, whether you're watching online, we're glad that you're a part of our family. And we want to come alongside of you as you continue to grow in your walk with God and continue to say yes to God. You see, we are a church on a mission to join God in his mission by inviting people to find hope in Jesus. We not only talk about Jesus when we're in our building, but we talk about Jesus everywhere we go as we encounter people in our community. This week, we're celebrating 5,281 gospel conversations. We want to continue to celebrate those who are sharing their faith and continue to encourage you that you too can be a part of what God is doing in this region by continually sharing the story of Jesus. This week, we're going to continue in our series on the Sermon on the Mount by talking about the sin of judgmentalism. J.D. Walt said the grave problem with carrying a spirit of judgment is that the carrier is usually the last to know. Now, I know this is true because it was true in my life. You see, growing up, I never got along with my middle brother, Timothy. We never saw eye to eye. I was bigger than him. I was the older brother. I was older than him by three years, which meant that I was a lot stronger and a lot bigger than him. And so my tactic growing up was always to overpower him and make him do whatever I wanted him to do. He, on the other hand, was smaller than me, so he had to play the mind game and would often get inside my head. And I remember occasions where he would come to me and tell me that uh, to just watch because he was going to get me in trouble. And before you knew it, I would lose my temper uh, and I would be standing before my parents and I would get in trouble. Growing up, he always seemed to be manipulative and trying to get people to do whatever he wanted to do. And, and, and our relationship just continued to be strained. Growing up, it didn't seem to matter what I did. Uh, I wasn't able to fix things between my brother and I. Now, as a 17-year-old, I knew that things were bad, and, and, and by that time in my life, I had been hurt pretty significantly by my brother. I had allowed many of the things that he had done to go to my heart, um, and um, I came to a place where uh, the only thing I knew to do was to cut him out of my life. You see, I would come to a place as a 17-year-old where I realized I was getting ready to go away to college, and that... I had this aha moment. When I go away to college, at that time, I didn't really plan on ever coming back. I planned on getting a job and moving out. And, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm never going to have to talk to my brother again. And so I devised this plan that starting that day, um, I was just going to pretend my brother didn't exist. And so for the next several months, we lived in the same house. But I pretty much uh, acted as if my brother didn't exist as much as possible, I just ignored my brother. I wanted nothing to do with him. And I'm not sure how long this went on, but at the time it felt like it was months and months. But I can still remember the day my dad came to me and sat me down and had a true heart to heart and helped me to come to a place where I realized that my brother was always going to be a part of my life. And my dad helped me to come to a place where I began to realize that while my brother had hurt me in pretty significant ways, uh, I was not blameless in this whole thing. I had hurt him just as much and truthfully, maybe more than he had hurt me. Um, I don't know if either of us will ever know who hurt the other more, and that's not really the point. But he helped me to come to a realization that simply pretending that my brother didn't exist was not really fixing the problem. And it was in that conversation that God began to uh, opened my eyes to see that I had become a part of the problem. 
I was judging him by a standard that I wasn't even living up to. And now I, after that conversation, I went and apologized to my brother and uh, that began to change our relationship moving forward. But as I reflect back on those months, um, I can't really tell you that I noticed any change in my brother at that time. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't change because looking back, we are both different people than we were 20 years ago when this happened. But something changed in me because God began to bring healing to my heart. And I began to realize that... uh, My wholeness as an individual and the healing that God wanted to bring in my life was not dependent on the actions of other people. Yes, it is true that he had done things that were hurtful to me. And I had done things that were hurtful to him. But my healing was not determined by his willingness to make things right. But my healing was determined what God wanted to do in my life. Today, I want to look at Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. This is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Looking back at my relationship between my brother growing up, I realized that while he had a speck in his eye, I had a plank in my eye. And I was allowing God, or I was allowing that spirit of judgmentalism, that focus on him as being the problem, to actually keep me from experiencing the healing that God wanted to provide in my life. As we continue in this series, I want to address what this passage teaches us about judgment. The first thing we see in this passage is that it always begins in our heart. We've been talking a lot about the kingdom of God recently because, truthfully, Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God seems to be the central theme of Jesus' message. And as we continue on the topic of judgment, I want to remind you that Jesus is continually calling his followers to a third way. You see, as we look at this passage, it's important that we understand that Jesus doesn't pick sides here. Now, what do I mean by that? You see, those outside the religious elite, they knew that God wasn't on their side. I mean, the religious leaders continued to remind them what Scripture says about sin and that they were far from God. Like, they expected that. They knew they weren't living up to the standard that God was calling people to live up to. But what nobody expected when Jesus arrived on the scene was that Jesus very clearly displays in the Sermon on the Mount that even the religious leaders were failing to make the cut. You see, we can't lose sight of the fact that when we read the Gospels, when we read through the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus is continually calling us to a third way. A way that often puts us um, on a different path than both the religious community and the non-religious community. He's calling us to live in his kingdom. To live under a radically new set of rules. You see, no one reads the Sermon on the Mount and says, Whew, glad that's the standard because if that's the standard, I'm good to go. No, we all read the Sermon on the Mount and we're like, oh my goodness. If that's the standard, I'm not going to make it. If I have to live up to that standard, there's no way that I can make it without the hope of Jesus living in us. Scott McKnight, talking of this passage, said that what Jesus does here is complex. He creates self-awareness leading to self-judgment. 
This leads to humility, which in turn leads to repentance and sanctification. If anything, the Sermon on the Mount brings each and every one of us to a place of self-awareness. You see, the more we read the Sermon on the Mount, the more and more we, we become aware of just how far we have fallen short of God's standard. We become aware of just how much we need the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. The more and more we become aware that the only reason we are able to live any different from those around us is not because we've tried harder, but because we've simply surrendered our life to Christ and allowed Him to work in and through us. And so as followers living in the kingdom of God, we begin to see the world differently because we're not looking at it through self-righteous eyes that are saying, I am better than everyone else. Now, someone who has encountered Jesus and has been entered into the kingdom of God, we begin to see others through the lens of the kingdom, realizing that I'm not in the kingdom of God because of anything I've done. I'm in the kingdom of God because of what God has done on my behalf. My life has been changed and transformed, not because of anything that I've done, but because of what God has done in and through me. And when I look around the world and I see the broken, sinful people that our world is filled with, I can look on them with compassion. Because I realize that but for the work of God in my life, I would be in the same place. You see, this passage also reminds us that one day, all of us, will be judged by God. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Warren Wearsby said, the Pharisees played God as they condemned other people, but they never considered that God would one day be judging them. Now, growing up in the church, I understand the self-righteous spirit because truthfully, that's always been one of my greatest temptations. You see, growing up in the church, I learned really early how to put a face on things, how to, to look like I was doing the right thing, how to always have the right answer and always make the right decision when everybody else was looking. But my private life and my thought life were in a totally different place. And my heart was far from God. Everybody that knew me thought I was a good church kid. But my heart was no different than anyone else. You see, as a self-righteous church kid, it's, it's easy to take pride in the belief that someone else's sin is worse than my own. But a true encounter with Christ begins to change all of that. Because we begin to realize when we have a true encounter with God that begins to radically change our heart and begins to radically change the way we see the world around us, that our sin is no different than anyone else's. When God looks at the world, he doesn't have different levels of sin. All sin, if embraced, will keep us separated from God. But we have been invited into a new life that radically changes and transforms the way we live. And yes, those around us in the world have been marked by sin and have been fractured and broken by sin. And they might be far from God, but so was I. And as a follower of God, this passage reminds us that each and every one of us are going to one day stand before a good and holy God. And not one person will stand there and tell God about how good they were and why they should be invited into the kingdom of God. No, each and every one of us will stand before a good and holy God. And the only thing that we will have to say is I place my faith in the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross, his death, and his resurrection. And that I have been invited to live in his kingdom, not because of what I did, but because of what he did. And so as true followers of God, we no longer find ourselves comfortable in the, the self-righteous religious camp that, that, that takes pride in the fact that they are better than everyone else. And we no longer fit in the camp that's simply embracing our sin with, with disregard for what God might want. We find ourselves 
being restored into right relationship with God because we place our hope in the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And as we daily walk with Christ, He begins to change and transform us into the people He desires us to be. And when we begin to engage the world around us, we see the world around us differently. Not because of who we are, but because of who He is and the work that He is doing in our life. You see, the last thing that we see in this passage is that we search our hearts so that we can serve others. If you think that Jesus is saying in this passage that sin doesn't matter and that we should simply look the other way, you don't really understand what this passage is saying any more than the religious leaders of Jesus' day understood You see, I sometimes hear people making comments that the Bible condemns judging of any kind, but that's not entirely true. In his letter to the Corinth, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. He says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but the scripture says you must remove evil person from among you. Now, if I'm honest, I'd have to say that we in the religious community often have this backwards. We're much more bold in calling out the sins of those outside the church than we are of addressing the sins within the church. And yes, I believe it's important that we call sin, sin. But we need to be careful that we're not more concerned with the sins that those are struggling with outside the church than we are with addressing the sins that we are struggling with inside the church. I believe that the most effective thing that we can do to to see the gospel advance and, and spread across our nation is that we in the church actually start living the message that we that we're expecting those outside the church to live. One of our problems that we have in the church right now is that we actually have a higher standard for those outside the church than we do of those inside the church. We need to call sin, sin. But simply because someone is a part of our church family doesn't mean that we simply look the other way. We need to walk alongside individuals as together we discover what it means to know and experience God in our life. What does this look like? In Galatians 6, 1 through 3, Paul says this, brothers and sisters, If another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. And you are not that important. John Wesley said, The judging that Jesus condemns in this passage is thinking about another person in a way that is contrary to love. The judging that Jesus is condemning in this passage is approaching someone in a way that does not lead to love. Yeah, we need to come alongside of people and help them discover what it means to experience all that God has for us. But if we're approaching people simply to point out their sin in a way that's driving them away from God, we've misunderstood the calling that God has for us. This is why in this passage Jesus says that we must take the log out of our own eye before we can help other people. Because it's only as we begin to set before God and allow God to begin one at a time revealing to us the areas where we have fallen short of his perfect standard that we actually begin to understand and have compassion on those whose sins are different than us. Truthfully, as I look around the church, I think that we're really passionate about calling out the sins that we don't struggle with. One of the things that I see in the church, if I'm honest, is that we are passionate about talking about the the sin of abortion and the sin of homosexuality. Now, I realize that the church, uh, or that the Bible clearly says that every human life is valued. And I believe with all my heart that we have a calling and a moral responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless. But any time 
our approach to those outside the, the church is to be more concerned with letting everybody know where they are wrong and we are right to the point that we've actually lost sight of the fact that the people that we disagree with are also people that God is pursuing. When we're more concerned that those outside the church know that they're sinners and going to hell than we are, that they know that Jesus loves them and desires a relationship with them, we have missed our calling as Christians. I realize that the Bible clearly lays out God's plan for sexuality. The Bible talks a lot about sexual immorality. And truthfully, if you read the Bible with a humble spirit, you will discover that each and every one of us have sexual desires that have been broken by sin. The Sermon on the Mount tells us that if we're lusting after another person that's not our spouse, that's, that for me is not my wife, that that is sin. Each and every one of us is simply left to our own desires would act in ways that lead us farther and farther from God. And, and, and yes, the Bible is clear about sexual immorality, but we need to acknowledge that there's just as much sexual immorality among those who call themselves Christians as, as those outside the church. And as Christians, we need to come to a place where we're actually allowing God to speak into our life and say, am I actually living the life that God is calling me to? Am I actually being redeemed here? Because it's really easy to point out the sin that someone else struggles with without coming before God humbly and saying, God, what do you want to do in my life? Because what I've found is that when I give God permission to come into my life and begin to change me and begin to restore me into the person he desires me to be, it actually gives me a position to come alongside of other individuals and help them discover the love of God, that, that God actually loves them and desires a relationship with them. And, and yes, there's sin in their life, but the truth of the matter is that there was sin in my life. And if it wasn't for the love of God towards me, I would be in no different place than they are. My hope for each and every one of us is that we could come to a place where first and foremost, we begin to realize that God wants to change and transform us. He wants to give us a new ethic that we begin to see the world differently, that we begin to live holy lives. And we begin to realize that, yes, God wants to use us to help others to live holy lives. But before we can help others, we must first come before God humbly and allow him to change and transform our life. We need to be careful that we simply aren't getting caught up in the drama of the religious community any more than we're just simply blindly turning a blind eye and saying all sin is okay because all sin isn't okay. You see, when we look at sin in Scripture, we discover that, that sin is simply taking what God has said is good and using it in a way that it wasn't intended to. When God comes to us and begins to reveal the brokenness in our life, it's not because God is trying to hold something out on us, that God doesn't want us to experience life as it was meant to be lived. No, when God comes into our life and begins to convict us of the sin in our life, it's always because God knows that there's brokenness in our life that we can only experience hope and healing if we allow Jesus to come into our life and change and transform our life. So my prayer for each and every one of us is that we would truly be the people that God has called us to be. That we would let him change and transform us into new people that would be able to come alongside of others and help them find the hope and healing that can only come through a relationship with Jesus.